This week on The Change Law, we are back talking to Gerge Oros. This time, not quite about the insane tech hiring market, but more so the flip side, the 180, the not so good tech hiring market, the layoff market and what you can expect. There's a lot of fear, uncertainty and doubt out there. So hopefully this show gives you a lens into what's really going on and what to really expect and maybe more so how to keep your job or get a new job. Now, obviously, we come to this show with great compassion and great understanding. So please, hey, there is a community here for you. Changelog.com slash community. It's free to join. There's a lot of people in our Slack. Hang out with us. Call it your home. Hang your hat and stay a while. Everyone is welcome here. A massive thank you to our friends and our partners at Fastly and Fly. Our friends at Fastly make sure our pods are fast to download globally because, hey, Fastly is fast globally. Check them out at Fastly.com. And our friends at Fly let you deploy your app and your database close to your users all over the world with no ops required. Learn more at Fly.io. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Square. Develop on the platform that sellers trust. Here's what you could do with Square. You could bridge more experiences. You could build online, mobile, and in-person commerce experiences that connect more customers and sellers. You can build custom booking solutions. You can create and track orders. You can accept payments. You can manage and curate inventory. You can organize customers. You can manage employees. You can extend Square gift cards to your app. You can use Afterpay. And all this is powered by the world-class Square APIs and SDKs that enable you to build full-featured business apps for yourself or millions of Square sellers. So much is available as a Square Solutions partner. Learn more and get started at changelog.com slash square. Again, changelog.com slash square. Gary, you are back for what is now, I guess, the third annual appearance on the Changelog. Welcome back, friend. It's great to be back. Always great to be back. Good to have you back. Well, we first had you on recently after you left Uber, talking growing as a software engineer. A lot of your learnings from inside that particular tech giant were now freed and able to be talked about. And you began doing that. And then last year, gosh, we were having an insane tech hiring market. This was recorded in early October 2021 and shipped in mid-October, but not much had changed between recording and shipping. In fact, it was like the best of times to be a software engineer. And we were talking about everybody should go out and renegotiate their contracts or shop around. And this was like huge leverage. And I think the peak of the market, the overall markets was around November of 21. Ish. It was around November, uh, I think a little bit later as well. I think it was more January. Yeah, January, there was a precipitous drop. Th- there, there was still a spike and February was still pretty decent. And then things got really bad really quickly. <laughs> and here we are a year later, uh, as you said before, the show started a 180. It's pretty much the opposite of last year, isn't it? Very much so in, in many ways. Yeah, it's. Uh, I think that was an unexpectedly quickly heating up market. I, I was also very surprised to see just how quickly things have changed. And I guess now, you know, hindsight is 50-50, but we should have known that if things can heat up quickly, they can also cool down quickly. And, and it has cooled down very surprisingly quickly. And, and we're hearing news. There's obviously there's news about layoffs, but it's not just about layoffs. There's the hiring freezes. There's looking ahead. Some companies, some of big tech is not looking to hire. And a lot of the news is focusing on on VC funded companies and big tech. There's also silent maturity that we're not really hearing too much, but there's the more kind of traditional companies or companies that were not paying the, the top of the market. And there's actually some good news there as well. It's just as with any news, bad news usually trumps out good news or or no news really. Mm-hmm. A lot of anxiety out there in this market here for for that. What about this silent majority you mentioned? Like, what are the details? I know you got the scoop as part of your newsletter, but then you also scoop things on Twitter. So for lack of better terms, what's the scoop for this silent majority? What do you know there? Well, you know, the interesting thing is that we 
like the news has been dominated by layoffs because they are you know, they're, they're a big deal whenever they happen and now they've just been happening initially a few and then some more and now every week there's there, there's so many companies small or sometimes large doing it but the companies that are not really affected they're they're kind of hiring as always and in fact some are hiring more are the ones that are honestly just not they were never the most desirable companies to work at but i think this might change just a little bit uh, for example, I'll give you an example. There's a major bank in the Netherlands which saw a huge attrition at the end of 2021 because of this crazy market. Uh, maybe also because of my articles. I'm not sure because a lot, lot of people from, from that company <laughs> went and they, they took offers at you know the likes of Twitter or big tech or venture funded startups. Uh, just they just got a big pay increase and and this this bank couldn't move up with the market because that's not how they're structured. They cannot respond quickly and you know they typically don't so they lost a lot of people and they got into contractors and they have huge headcount to fill for 2022 and <laughs> i talked with the hiring manager there and they're like this is great like finally we might actually be able to hit our headcount but probably we won't we'll probably still have empty headcount so you know like the good news is that there are a lot of companies hiring and i'm also seeing i'm running a job board where companies can uh, pay to access either candidates or, or post jobs and I, I vet uh, these jobs but i'm also seeing growth there with a lot of uh, both ventures a lot of venture funded stars so there's a lot of venture funding especially at early stage going on and those companies they they want to hire they they need to hire good people and then there, there are the, the companies that are a little bit more conservative so a good example is adgen not many people know about adgen but if i say stripe you'll know what i'm talking about so adgen is the B2B version of Stripe. They're based in Amsterdam, actually, their headquarters. They're a publicly traded company and they were trading at about like $50 billion market cap. I'm not sure where they are right now, maybe like 40 or something like that. So they're, they're big. And they process about as much as Stripe in terms of uh, merchants. At Uber, for example, partially we used Adgen and I think they power eBay and Booking.com and a lot of the, the sites that you just don't see behind the scenes. And Stripe announced that they were doing 14% layoffs. Uh, meanwhile, Adyen, they're, they're, because they're a public trade company, you can see their financials. They're, they're just passively profitable. For every dollar, they make 60 cents of EBITDA profit. You know, that's not fully profit, but it's, it's a very strong signal. This is actually more profitable than, let's say, Google, even, uh, in terms of the, the percentage amount. And they just announced that they just sent out a, a memo to their staff that they're, they're, it's not that they're not laying off. They're actually investing because their fundamentals are strong. And, the headcount is also very different. This company, Adyen, even though they process about the same as a Stripe, and they have a bit lower cut rates, so their revenue will, will be a bit lower, but they have a lot less staff. They have about half the staff as Stripe and at lower cost locations. So all I'm saying is these are some of the companies that I know about who are kind of just doing fine, and there will be a lot of these, but uh, we should acknowledge that it's not the top of the market. So the, the companies that used to pay the best total compensation packages in terms of high base salary, great equity, all that, those companies are now struggling. And then, you know, there, there are still hiring. Like I, I just talked with someone who got an offer from Google in, in London, and it's a really good package. So there's all that going on, but I think the, the noise of, oh, you know, like all, all this bad news is really on top of people's minds. And then one last thing is if you look at, you know, what is actually happening in the market in terms of numbers, it is a correction. But when we look at, for let's say there's a big news that Meta laid off 13% of staff or 11,000 people, it's a huge number, 11,000 people. But when we look back of how quickly they hire those people, just this year, they hired 20,000 people. They are 87,000 people right now. So they're by just you know laying off, they're kind of back where they were at March, which is bad, right? But it just shows how much all companies actually hired. Like I rounded up uh, between Meta, Microsoft, and Google. I looked at their public filings of how many employees they have now and a year ago. And they went from having 400,000 employees, these three companies, full-time employees, 12 months ago, to having 500,000. So they, they added 100,000 in just one year. And these are, you know, like Microsoft is a 20-year-old company. Google is a, or sorry, older, like 30, 40-year-old. So in the last year, their growth was was incredible. So we are sitting, seeing a cutback, but it goes off that crazy, like that last year when we talked about. So it seems that it's a correction and it is painful and it's not happy to see. And, we, and honestly, I think the reason people are, are just really shocked, most people, in fact, we haven't seen this. This whole market reminds me of what we've seen in uh, what finance folks have seen in 2007, 2008. It's kind of our version of like a massive market correction in tech. 
And outside of tech, things are kind of going fine. You know, you talk with other industries and they're like, yeah, it's just like normal. We're not seeing any panic. Right. You have the typical supply chain problems, you got the inflation problems, but you don't have like the fundamentals are there and things are still moving forward as normal. I wonder how much of it is it maybe the unanswerable question, but how much of this was pandemic lockdown fueled? Because I mean, things changed so dramatically. The hiring, right? The Everybody went online. We heard tech execs saying things like, this is fast forwarded adoption by 10 years or five years. And we kind of expected that to like just continue, I guess, even after everything goes, the new normal, right? There was no back to normal. It was the new normal and it was going to stay like this. And so the hiring did go astronomical, like you cited at the big tech companies. They needed it because they had this increased capacity. Everybody's using their services. The stocks are going up. So they have extra funds to invest. And gosh, we finding out that like, I don't know, like there was no new normal or it's kind of going back. I mean, we, 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 it was it really wasn't like a fast forward. It was like a temporary fast forward, at least to a certain degree. Yeah, it, it's weird. It, it, it feels like this, the swing just swung the head and now it's swinging back. Yeah. Because like there was a fast forward, right, for, for a while where the whole world was locked down and, and digital became a lot more important. But I, I think a good example that I, I think of and I have a bit of insight into this company is Hopin. Hopin is this video uh, it's events company, so they do digital events. And they were founded in 2019, so a year before the pandemic. Uh, they raised, like I think, like a few million dollars of, of funding. And then the pandemic started. And right as the pandemic started, they raised a, a bigger funding uh, to scale the team because it seemed, okay, you know, like digital events will now be a thing because there's a lockdown. And they saw huge demand uh, in both 2020 and 2021 for their uh, solution. I actually organized, a, a, it was, you could organize online conferences with their tool. And I actually helped organize a digital conference. I think it was the fall of 2020 or something like that, because it was locked down. I didn't have anything to do. I was like, let, let me do this. And we looked at vendors and we chose Hopin in the end. I think we paid like a couple thousand for their, their license or, or whatnot. They, they had this licensing and, and we ran the event and it was a success and people liked it. But what I noticed is, and, and then the company kept raising more money, and at some point they were valued $7.8 billion or, or something. I, th I think that was the, the peak, uh, as, as I recall. And this was like two years into, into founding of the company. And, and then what happened is, as well, first of all, like just from my personal perspective, you know, I, I'm not going to represent all their users, but I just really got burnt of, of digital events. Like I went to a couple of these digital only conferences, and after a while I just started hating it. I was doing Zooms all day, every day. So I just didn't want to go there. And as soon as the world started to open up, I, I've just been to my first uh, proper conference. I, I, I love the, the the normal conference format and I would not, okay, maybe I would jump on to watch a video online, but I don't think it's really important. And and then with this company Hopin, they they saw their, their growth just first stall. And the thing that might save the company is they actually bought a, a bunch of different companies. They bought StreamYard, which is a streaming company, uh, and, and they bought a few other stream, uh, like video streaming companies. And what I've heard from, from people who work there is their events revenue, that their flagship thing is, is just going down because they're, it's, it's really hard to sell right now. People just don't need a digital-only solution anymore. And my point is they're, an, they're a bit of an outlier, but they're a typical pandemic company where it seemed the whole world would change. A lot of money went into there. And if the whole world would have changed and we would now be doing a digital only conference, it would make sense because they would probably be market leaders. But the world has gone back. And I think we're seeing this, this backswing uh, a lot of times. So I, I've seen a chart about e-commerce adoption where it spiked and it did look like it's, it's jumping up ahead by 20 or by five years or 10 years, but then it came back and now we're just on that, that normal growth. So this growth is back to where it was before, which means that everyone who expected that in 2022 or 2023, you're gonna have similar growth to 2021, just overhired and now they're all correcting because, uh, well, because also don't, don't forget, there's a second part here, which is not just the COVID shrinking, but uh, the interest rates are up, which means it's, it's a lot more expensive to borrow any sort of money, which a lot of tech companies have been doing. So they can borrow money, so they need to rein in their costs if they're not profitable. And, and like, you know, th those are just a few things where we're not going to be able to figure out exactly what's happening. But uh, the pandemic was like, it's, it's just so strange because for the rest of the world, take an industry like hotels or hospitality, right? You're kind of working in a hotel or managing a hotel. 
the pandemic was terrible, right? You got shut down, you had no revenue, you were trying to survive. For tech, it was the opposite. It was amazing and it was gr it was great that time because we had to with more jobs, more money. There were people, I think, you know, quitting because they like people even had a lot of options. Like it was a great time to be in tech and now it's the opposite. Like if you work in hospitality, things are great. More and more people are traveling, like it's going up. You're gonna get uh, more, hopefully you're gonna be earning more, getting more tips, whatnot. And now in tech, it's the opposite. It's just not great if you're in tech. I mean, it's not great to see the news. Hopefully like it, it, this is impacting people. There is a question of how many people are really impacted in the sense of not just being laid off, but not finding a job. And I think that's where we're going to see a long tail effect or like a double down, you know, people who are software engineers, experienced engineers who are being laid off at well-known companies. I think they're going to, it's hard. Like I'm not, I don't want to trivialize this, but they will have options to work somewhere. It might not be as great though, as their current company in terms of maybe culture or compensation or both, but they will have options. The problem is that all of this will trickle down. You know, we're now seeing thousands of really competent software engineers being on the market. So startups are really happy. These banks are really happy. Uh, I have some friends at Uber, for example, uh, former friends who I, I used to work. One of my first jobs was at JP Morgan uh, in London, an investment bank. And at the time, like I, I really liked that job because it was one of my early jobs and it was a great place to be. But when I got my next job at Skype, I just realized JP Morgan was totally not a tech company. And it was I'm so, I was so happy to finally work at a tech company. And I said I would never go back to, you know, like a place like JP Morgan. Uber was also had a really good engineering culture in, in the sense that it was one of the best places I worked at. And now I have some friends and, and colleagues who work at JP Morgan. And I talk with them and I say, like, dude, like, why did you kind of take a step down? And he told me like, so here's the thing, like two things. First of all, it's just really, really stable. Like, like they have super profits. I get all my compensation in cash. None of that stock going up and down and mostly down. Second of all, they actually want to create a tech culture and finally they can hire the people into this. They have a lot of these greenfield projects where it's full of X, <laughs> they have X Facebook, X Google, X whatever people. And they're like, it's, it's actually, it's actually pretty good. So it's, I think the world is changing a little bit and the people are realizing that pre-IPO companies or, or, or even any form of companies that give you stock, it has a massive risk. So traditional wisdom the past 10 years was if you are a publicly traded company, you get like you know half of your compensation if you're a senior engineer or a staff engineer, half of your compensation and base salary and the other half on equity, that's great because equity will always go up. Well, equity for some companies has collapsed by let's say 70 or 80%. And I, I talk with people who were, you know, earning on paper, they were earning $500,000 uh, in Silicon Valley. And now it's just went down to like 350 or 300. And they're saying like, what should I do? Should I interview somewhere else? But, but now there's fewer jobs or should I just stick it out? And there, there's no good answers. But the point is like, now you're really seeing those banks. They're one of the reasons people are going to these banks. They might pay, let's say, you know, for a similar scale. Maybe, maybe they pay three fifty or four hundred or, or or less or more. It doesn't really matter. But it's it's fixed. <laughs> it just doesn't move. And the people who I know who have families and, and they just want stability. They're like, you know what? It's a good trade off. It's it's rocky time. I'm gonna sit it out here. And you know what? It's kind of nice because now those companies can hire just like people who would have never considered working there. So we might see the industry transform a little bit from the unsexy companies companies becoming a bit more sexy and the sexy companies, uh, let's give you an example, Coin, Coinbase. Coinbase was such a hot company to go and work for a year ago. And, you know, they're doing crypto. And if you're into that, uh, I'm not that much into it. But but again, they're, they're doing something something really interesting in that space, you know, trying to give uh, new financial instruments. And they were paying really, really good. Like they were giving ridiculous uh, stock packages to people who were accepting it. And now the company is not doing that great. The space is kind of, it's, it's unclear if, if what the future will be and their stock is not doing that great. So, you know, that company or, or some of these hot startups have just gone from being one of the best places to work at to, oh, it's, it's a risky place. And we'll see if they'll be able to grow. And I'm not just talking about Coinbase. I'm just talking about the hot companies in 2021. That was my fear with, you know, last year when we talked was this insane tech hiring market and people jumping ship or, not so much not being loyal, but sort of focusing on the opportunity to increase their their dollars. And then that comes with the the value trade of like, okay, we're, I'm going to be with a, a startup or a high growth or a innovation focused company like Hopin or Coinbase, as you mentioned, that are paying these high compensation equity. And like you said, on paper, it's a lot of money and they jump and they, you know, not so much leave their teammates in a lurch or whatever, but like look out for themselves and 
earn more money. And then now the flip side is the market is now shifted. And I don't know if that, you know, is necessarily bad for the reputation, but that was my concern was like this, this sort of jump because you can, because you can make more. Is that the reason why you leave a team? Is that the reason why you pursue a new job? And I think what you described there was the opportunity to have stability, but then also the opportunity to innovate. Like what engineer, what developer doesn't want to play with the fun stuff and do the fun things? And sometimes that is at Coinbase. Sometimes that is at Hopin or these future innovative places where they're like really pushing the boundaries with front-end frameworks or infrastructure or just new ways of doing things. And sure, that's fun. But that was my concern was like, you know, this jump, is it, was it worth it? Is it worth it? Do you talk to anybody that made those jumps? It's like, man, I kind of regret doing that because now this. Yeah. So, so I actually talk with, like, I have a few stories here and like, first off the, I think jumping for doing something fun is good. And like, if, like, if you take the money out and you're doing it not because of the money, that's a great thing. Cause that's a more of an interesting motivation. The problem is if, like, if you were doing it mostly for the money, I think what was missing until now, and I think this is being corrected, like where I feel every 10 years, there's like some sort of event in the world that kind of shakes things up a little bit. And in tech, there was a little bit of like contraction in like 2008. Uh, it, it was like bad, but not as bad as potentially now. And I heard in 2001, I wasn't around, but I heard it was really bad. And But but then tech was a lot smaller. Like tech has become massive since, since 2001. But what I think people forgot, or they just didn't see because they only saw the positive stories, is the risk that any startup has like that the fact that these are super risky and and they're so risky because they can absolutely go bankrupt uh, your equity will probably just not be worth anything and this is by the way and it's interesting and I'm, I'm i'm based in europe and in europe people were always super skeptical about stock if at uber when we were hiring people we told them all right here's you know here's this much stock and they were like could i just like get half of it or no stock and could i get like five thousand more in base right and they were like no 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 but it's, it's it's really like you don't understand this could turn into a lot of money and they're like like i know what i know it's money. That's not money, <laughs> like or, right. uh, or, or or these things. But uh, now that's actually turning to be very much true. So, you know, take Hopin. A lot of people were given options at later stage companies, and if you're given like stocks, like double trigger RSUs or something like that, it might be worth still something. If even if the company is worth little, with options, they're just worth nothing because it's it's all underwater, and. I think people thought that because a company raised a lot of money and it were billions, it, it must be something valuable and they were already assigning a number to it. So I, so, so going back to specific stories, I, I do know people who left, you know, like publicly traded companies and they were offered a similar compensation package at a private company, which was just a startup that had a high or, or medium valuation and they thought that they would 10x. You know, a good example is Fast. Fast. Uh, what was a company that I covered? They, they were the company who famously raised $100 million in 2021. And then 12 or 14 months later, they burned the whole thing. They spent it all and they went bankrupt and they closed shop. And I've seen the chart on how they closed it. They hired from people from everywhere, from, from Uber, from Google, from Facebook, you name it, like all the companies. And the way they hired these people is, first of all, they paid the same or a little bit higher base salary than, let's say, Facebook did for the same level. And we're talking about Silicon Valley people and people based in the U.S. or New York or these things. So they paid a little bit more in cash. But the big part of the compensation back was just stock. And then they, they show people, they are like, we're giving you like this much stock, which today on the today's valuation is, is or like if the company were, grows by 10 or 20 percent, uh, it's going to be worth as much as your current stock. But uh, I think they're saying that Fast was valued something at... Maybe a, I think it was valued at close to a billion, but but if it's valued at thirteen billion, which is how much their competitor Bolt was valued at their latest valuation, basically you're going to be millionaire uh, or or even bigger. And they just showed those numbers in a spreadsheet that that showed it, and, and they were telling the truth in the sense that if this happened, that stock package would have been worth. And most people in their minds calculated that oh, it's gonna it's gonna be for sure worth thirteen billion. Right, counting chickens that didn't hatch. And, and then a lot of people, you know, just left a lot of uh, real money on the table to join a risky thing. But this risk was not really added there. So, like, if you ask me, like, just from a pure financial perspective, if you join a startup that's early stage, you might actually just want to ask for, like, rationally, you might want to ask for a premium. Like, you might, might want to ask for more base salary because it's a risky place which could shut down and this could be worth nothing, which is obviously not what's happening, but that would be the rational thing to do. But we forgot about this risk. So there's a big risk with the startups. And 
one story of a software engineer who just got really unlucky because they they misread the market. So this person was working. I think it was it was. I don't want to say the specific name of the company, but this is a, re, a real person. They were working at one of the. Okay, I'll just say like one of these three: DoorDash, Roblox, uh, or Pinterest. I just don't want to like narrow it down. So one of these three companies they were working there, and they joined in the middle of 2021, uh, where it, I think it was a new grad or, or maybe software engineer too. So someone pretty early career. And they got a package where it was base salary and then a bunch of stock, like pretty good stock package. And six months later, by the end of 2021, the stock has already gone down for all of these companies by about 50% from just the middle of 2021. It was like the six months where, so their stock package was worth like half. And I think it was down even like 55%. And this person was like, oh man, I'm only six months in. I haven't even invested my first vest, which will be at a year. But uh, you know what? Like this is this is just like, uh, I, I didn't sign up for this. Like my, my, my composition went down. And here's this cool thing called Web3 that is doing really well. So this person joined the Web3 company and negotiated his original package, but in, in Web3 tokens or, or maybe not even tokens, but like, you know, like a equity in, in, in that Web3 company. So and then this person got really unlucky, and this is a, a actual true story. So four months later or five months later, around April 2022, the Luna uh, token collapsed. There was the stable coin, which was an algorithmic stable coin, which somehow some bad actor exploited. And as a result, there was this anchor protocol that yielded like something like eight or 10 percent or I think 18 percent interest supposedly risk free. And the startup of this guy held all their treasury in this anchor protocol. And so they just went bankrupt overnight. So there was this guy who, who joined, who left a company that the stock was going down. And it was a rational thing to do. Like, you know, why would you stay? Like, you can just like make, make more money taking a bigger risk, took a bigger risk, which went absolutely to zero. And I don't know what actually happened with them if they went back or if, if they went something else. But it was just a chain of, of bad events. And then, you know, another person who, like, there are some, like, these people find me online. There's a person who was at Fast, which went bankrupt and then joined the competitor Bolt, which then had layoffs. And I, I think they, they managed to uh, miss that. But it, it just shows that it, it is now hard to find a company that will definitely not be doing any layoffs. And yeah, it's, it, it, it's a market we've just never, we've not seen. Like, I, I don't think anyone has been used to it. The most common question I get these days, like a year ago, it was like, hey, which company should I join that pays the most? Now, the most question, common question I get is which company, like how can I evaluate companies that don't have a list of, of layoffs? And th this last question is hard to answer because I, for example, really thought for a long time that Meta will not do layoffs because I looked at their bottom line, their profits, their, their, their money printing machine. They still are. And they still did layoffs because, I mean, we, we can go into that, but their profit was just dropping because their revenue was flat and their costs were going up and shareholders will not take any of that and, and their stock price was collapsing, which if they would have not done layoffs, they would have seen a lot of attrition because a lot of people are just people I talk with Meta, they're just really unhappy. They're going to make a lot less money in 2022 than they did in 2021 because of their outside stock packages. This episode is brought to you by Sentry. Build better software faster, diagnose, fix, and optimize the performance of your code. More than a million developers and 68,000 organizations already use Sentry, and that includes us. Here's the easiest way to try Sentry. Head to sentry.io slash demo slash sandbox. That is a fully functional version of Sentry that you can poke at. And best of all, our listeners get the team plan for free for three months. Head to Sentry.io and use the code CHANGELOG when you sign up. Again, Sentry.io and use the code CHANGELOG. So there's a phenomenon in inflation. I think it's called spiral inflation. I'm not sure if that's the term. What is this idea of, you know, rising prices? And when you're running, let's say you're running a convenience store, 
And regardless of whether or not your supply costs are going up, which they probably are if there's inflation going on, you see everybody else raising their prices. And so you say, I'm going to raise my prices. And then the next person sees you raise. And so they raise. And so this kind of the spiral effect. And I wonder if there's something like that going on with the layoffs. Like perhaps it's perhaps it's a timely opportunity to also do layoffs, even if you don't really need them, because you're never going to get a better opportunity and everybody's doing it. Do you think there's some of that going on? Oh, totally. Absolutely. So the at, at the first few layoffs, like I think Fast was the first like big layoff story. And it's interesting how it impacts people as as well. Uh, so Fast shut down and it was a big story because it's also very it's just a very like you can imagine yourself being that CEO and every person who's listening would think that they would do a better job with $100 million than just burn it over a year. So that's kind of it. It's a, it's a sticky thing, uh, even though I'm sure there's a lot more uh, nuance to it. But they were the first one who just let the whole company go. And this was extensively covered by the press. I actually covered it a lot because it was just an interesting story where like, hey, can we learn some lessons? Uh, and, and there were some lessons. But I talked with the engineers who were laid off and they were bombarded with so many messages and every single one of them got a better job or a, a similar job most of them got actually a higher, higher base salary than they did at Fast, which already paid very well. And I talked with someone who said like they had, they got about a hundred reach outs and they talk with, they just narrowed it down. They were like selecting, they only talked with 20 companies. They only got five offers and they, you know, negotiated and took the, the last offer. And this was the first one and everyone paid attention and everybody paid attention to the next few layoffs. This is when I actually, on Twitter, I started to cover some of these uh, layoffs because they were so rare. And now they became so common that I think there's a layoff numbness. I, I stopped a week ago on my Twitter. I, I just said that I'm not going to cover any more layoffs as they happen because I'm getting a lot of these people reach out to me and they say like, oh, my company is doing layoffs. Uh, uh, like, here's all the details. Please don't share uh, anything that could identify me. But they're now so frequent that, first of all, it's, it's just, it feels it's just, you know, I'm bringing attention to so many companies having pain and it's, it's just a bit, bit of a negative thing to, thing to do. But as you said, there's a, I think people, at least in tech, are kind of checked out. Like in the first few months, you could tell exactly the few companies that did layoffs because they were all over the news. And it's a very convenient, like as a CEO, it's a very, very convenient way to just put it in there uh, because you don't even need to justify, you just say economic conditions, like half of the announcements from CEOs come say like, oh, macro and economic conditions. And when you look around, a lot of the layoffs are not big ones. They're not like companies fighting for their life. They're just conveniently laying off like between like six to 15% of, of staff. Uh, often, usually not many software engineers. Some companies do. But at, at this point, like I feel even employees are not really surprised or, or they're a lot more empathetic. And this is what I, I read. This is a comment I read on Hacker News. Someone, there was a comment of, of Meta doing layoffs because was, that, was, that was a huge layoff. And someone on Hacker News said, like, hey, I've been around for the dot com bust. And here's what I can tell you. Like, if you've been laid off in this round, know that you're the lucky one because you got a really good severance package uh, and companies are still paying a lot of attention. But I can tell you that layoffs will keep happening. And the next round, they're not going to be as generous because no one's going to pay attention. So <laughs> it was like, I know it's counterintuitive, but you were actually, companies still pay a lot of attention and they uh, they, they want to look, look in good color. So that's a little bit of the, the depressing news that this might keep happening for a while. And which, which I actually, you know, I, I guess it does bring back to like, you know, what, what are the things that you might be able to do personally to get on the better side of all of this? Yeah. So gosh, that's a kind of a weird silver lining there is your severance package might be better than other folks who get laid off later. Also, I guess your first one back on the market. So maybe you have more opportunities than later on. That, that as well, the, the, the market is still better than it will be likely in, let's say, six months, uh, just the way things are trending, honestly. Yeah. So, you know, like the when fast laid people off. So the first companies actually to lay off, they get bad press, but you don't know until you look back. But it's, but it is a usually a good market and people pay attention. You can all the fast alumni got hired, like every single person like they the only people who had a gap is the people who wanted to get a gap. It'll probably be a little bit harder for people now. And if this cycle continues a bit hard to predict the future, but I don't see why it would stop for the next, like, let's say, like three to six months for sure. Uh, while interest rates are high, VC money is, is tight, inflation is going to hit. So like consumers and businesses are going to start looking on how to save. So it, it just is going to, everyone's tightening the belt and eventually everyone will kind of feel it somewhere. So there's probably our listener in, in a few different situations. The first one is I haven't been laid off, but I know that cuts are coming. What can I do now, pr 
perhaps to help avoid the axe. And then there's also like, I had, I have been laid off and now what do I do? Like, what's my next best move? So maybe do you have advice for people and you can't say, you know, don't make fun of Elon in public. Cause you're certainly going to get axed if you do that. Yeah. But uh, aside from Twitter, whose offings are quite public, a lot of these companies, I don't know. I don't know how they make their decisions. Uh, again, lines of code, that's another uh, easy one, <laughs> but like, what can you do to avoid being laid off at this stage of the game? Like, can you impress a certain person? Can you change the way you act now? Is it inevitable? It's just going to happen. What do you think? Yeah. So, uh, on, on the layoffs, actually, one of my good friends, uh, Karthik, uh, Hari Haran, his, he's, uh, I know Karthik I used to work with him. Really? Mm-hmm. Pure charity. Awesome. Yeah. Karthik is a good friend. Yeah. Well, we, we know each other from Uber, mostly actually after Uber, we talk a lot. And uh, he has some, like, he's now a senior engineering manager at Roblox. He was uh, an engineering manager at Uber as well. And he has some really good uh, career advice. And, like, he actually had one of the best advices. He actually said, like, all right, here's my advice for everyone who's not been laid off, but knowing that things are happening. And he said uh, three things. We can, we can find a tweet and we can add it to the, the notes here. I'll find it. He said, number one is just cut your expenses. Now is not the time to buy the new car, to go on a holiday, build up a nest egg. If you're working in tech, you are probably making more money than some of your peers who are working in other industries. Just cut your lifestyle, like, like start saving up. Because the reality of layoffs is that you cannot control it fully. It, it can hit you, you can do your best job, but if you're at the wrong team, uh, or, or your your CEO decides, you know, you're not going to do it. So just prepare for that. Like have a few months of savings, or as, as, and and build that up. So you know, maybe for now, for for holidays, you know, like again, just just be a bit conservative because this is a little bit like inconvenience right now. But it could actually make a big difference later for your mental health or or knowing that you're there. The second thing that that he said, which I absolutely agree with, is just work to be in the top twenty five percent in terms of performance. You know, now is actually the time to do great work and, and put yourself in there because when, when people are laid off, unless it's a massive layoff, like 50% or something, the, the crazy stuff that we've seen at Twitter, most of it is not like that. They're going to like lay off 10 or 20% and they'll typically look at the people who are just not doing great work. So the lower performers, they might look at teams who are, who they can miss, but the rarest thing to lay off is the, is the high performers, the people who are people are known like these are doing great work and they're flexible. You know, now is the time to, you know, do great work to say yes to additional uh, things. It's a little bit like when you're new at a company, like you want to prove yourself. Now is actually the time where if you want to guarantee this, then, then prove yourself. A third one, I'm not sure what he did, what he said, but but my, my third advice is just be a little bit aware, like look around, figure out, are you in a profit center? In, in, in companies, every company, including tech companies, there's cost centers and profit centers. Profit center is the one that, that brings the money in. So, you know, for example, at Google, it's the ads team. If you work around ads, you are generating money. If you are working at customer support, it's a very important thing to do, but it's a cost center which the company typically wants to minimize its expenses on. And actually, Google historically does not have that much uh, customer support. But, uh, you know, for example, at, at Uber, this was the same thing. Like if I was working, I, I was working in a profit center, I was working on the, well, some part of this profit, I was working on the payments team, which is a little bit both, but I, I was working when my team owned projects that if we shipped it, we made more money for the company. That's a profit center. And if your work is about like minimizing costs or like compliance or those things, that's a cost center. So try to figure out where you are. And if you are going to move, if you have an opportunity later to move into a profit center, you know, like, think about that, but that's something that might be out of your control. And then finally, you know, switching jobs is a lot more risky because tenure is also important in, in, in layoffs often. It's, it's rare to have the longest timer person be laid off. So plan your steps uh, carefully if, 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 you, if you do it. Uh, and, and this goes back, I guess, to one last advice is, is your, your network. Now, this is something you can, like, if you have a strong network, you'll be fine. Even if you're laid off, you can talk to people who know you and then they'll they'll probably refer you. Now, this is something you cannot change overnight. It's not a month or two, but just show up every day and do do good work, help people even when, when you don't need to. You know, like if, if someone is having some something tough, help them, just be a great colleague because this is stuff that, this will come back years later. It's not gonna be right now. So it's gonna be, honestly, it's just gonna be a bit of tighter 
market, I think everyone's going to be more paranoid. The number one thing that you can do is, like, I think that's the, the biggest thing in your control is get a nest egg. Like get, the, get those savings going if you don't have it. If you have six months of savings or a year of savings, you're going to be way more chill. Like if you're an experience, the reality is if, you're, if you have experience on this market, you're not going to have trouble finding another job. The question is, like, will you find the job that, that you'll want or will you settle midway? And uh, one, one last thing is just just be realistic. Like now, it's not a good time. Now is a time where you probably just want to sit out this storm. Uh, there's there's always cycles coming and going. So we've seen there was this like amazing surge of of tech. Now it seems as a downturn or, or a winter or however you call it. This will also pass, but it's a good time to just you know wait it out at a place where you feel secure. This might be your your current team, might be your current company. Or if if you have to change companies, this this is where the the not not the previously non sexy companies are becoming sexy because stability is actually a really good selling point right now on which company to join. Stability is sexy. Stability is sexy, and the, again, if if you're 20 and you don't care that much, maybe you don't care as as much about it. But when you have a family or when you're in that stage of your life, stability is now becoming a selling point. Mm-hmm. Like I said, that was my fear with last year was just that movement and the tenure you mentioned, like if you made those moves during that time, which is great if you made them for the right reasons, the right circumstances, and you didn't burn bridges and you maintain your network or maintain being, I guess, a, a good person during the process, then, you know, that still doesn't change your tenure. And, you know, this just reminds you so much, like you did say this, by the way, I think I wasn't paying as much attention to like how things could, I was really like just focused on like how well things are going. I was really happy actually that the market was there. But it reminds me of like if you were if you did not burn bridges. So there's a Silicon Valley episode when they go fundraising and initially like no VCs take their call and then Ehrlich starts to just insult them. And the more he insults them, the more they take their calls and the higher offers he gets. And then there's this final scene where they just walk out and they said, like, did you really put your privates on the table? And then they get the biggest check from there. And this all looks really good until like fast forward, I think. Just a, a few weeks later in the show, uh, their funding falls through and no one wants to fund them. And now they need to go back to all of those VCs and they get the exact same insults back, including on the last meeting. The VC says, like, I remember what you did here last time. I'm going to do this exact same thing to you. So going back to burning bridges, you know, like in the good market, for example, if you this is not the, the biggest one, but I now hear a lot of people trying to go back to well, some people trying to go back to their older companies. For example, they joined a startup from, let's say, Google or somewhere, and now they're actually didn't work out. They want to go back to stability, which is Google or, or some other companies. And if they left on a good relationship, sure, that's probably no problem. Their, their manager will try to do, but not everyone did. Like some people did burn bridges, or when they negotiated their offers, you know, how respectfully they treated hiring managers uh, when you had multiple offers open and you rejected, let's say you had three offers, you rejected two, like did you leave it on good foot or were you just really snotty about it? Because if you were snotty when you're going back or if that company is still hiring, you don't really have a contact. So I think it's a great reminder that no matter how the world is, especially when it's really good, you really, really want to treat people with respect. And this is this goes back to your network. If you treated those hiring managers with respect, and when you turn it down, you actually told them all the things that you liked about them. You were open about, you know, you didn't like try to do all sorts of sneaky things. You probably increased your network Is a hiring manager might now remember you fondly of like, oh, I, I remember it made perfect sense that the person turned us down. And it wasn't just for the money. It was a better fit when they chose this other, other company. Be a good person, man. Be a good person. The shoe is, is always, you know, swapping feet, you know, it rolls reverse. And I think above all, just do your best to be a good person in any process. Treat people with respect. Explain, you know, defend your reasons for your change or whatever, but do it respectfully. And, and my gosh, do not burn bridges. See, when you're younger, you, not that like it's a, I did this when I was young. I burned a few bridges when I was younger. And I learned like, gosh, you know, in hindsight, that was the worst way to do these things. Like, why would you do that now that I understand that the shoe does move to the other foot and things do change? But, you know, do your best to learn that lesson learn it from me or or not at all, but do not burn bridges the best you can. Maintain relationships, leave on good standings, be kind, and you know, somehow, some way, you'll get a chance to serve them again in the future or have them serve you if if you've been generous, kind, etc. It's short sightedness, right? And this is just I think a natural thing, but you know, when times are good, it's easy to think about today and tomorrow and not think about down the road. You know, I 
I had grandparents that went through the Great Depression and like just the way that they looked at life after having that experience was way different than beforehand, being born into it or going through it as an adult. And like you said, Gergay, we've never been through this. Like if you entered the tech industry in the last 15 years, even if you don't count 08, I mean, 01, like the dot com bust was really the last major, major correction. And it was so much smaller back then. It's been good times for at least a decade, you know, probably 15 years. And then you had the pandemic outlier, turns out, right? You had the lockdown, which looked like it was going to be a new normal, but it was, turns out it's like a statistical black swan event that kind of reverted. We haven't seen this before. And so you tend to think differently when it's always been up and to the right, pretty much. And it's not that, it's not always going to be that way. It's also really interesting because the last decade, right? Like from 2008, which is actually when the, financial crisis ended. And it did hit tech a little bit. It depends on what region, but for the most part, it, it wasn't as bad as, as it is now. But that was combined with the revolution of there was still the internet boom going on. The internet was still spreading. I remember like the stats every year, more and more people were on the internet. And the mobile smartphone revolution started. So those things drove, you know, companies like Facebook were, Facebook was founded in 2004, Snap was founded uh, later, Dropbox, uh, Pinterest, uh, sorry, uh, maybe not Pinterest, but Airbnb, they were all founded around like 2008. And there's this wisdom, I think Paul Graham likes to say that the best time to start a startup is during a recession. And he kind of referred to how many great companies were born. It's, you know, Y Combinator was also, I think, started around that time or started investing. But I think what everyone conveniently figures is that there was a technology revolution going on and there was there was a whole new host of companies. Uber was actually started in like 2010 off of iPhone. And so there was this huge demand to get people to build things that did not exist at a new scale, uh, you know, distributed systems, mobile, web, you name it, it, it was on fire. But what I'm a little worried about is I look ahead at, for the next 10 years, you know, like what, what are, do we have some a similar technology revolution and internet is everywhere, mobile phones are everywhere. The metaverse actually and argumented reality is there. I think meta is investing so much because they hope that this will be the next revolution, but it seems that it'll be a lot smaller, if anything. There's AI that's kind of spreading, but it's not taking the whole industry by as much force as we've seen. So I'm kind of wondering if we're going to look back, are we going to say that this was a golden decade for employees in terms of there's such incredible demand that just being an employee and taking very little risk, you could make outsized income if you were at the right place at, at the right time at the right companies, but even working at these big companies. And we might see now that the market is cooling that there will be just fewer of these opportunities and it'll be more niche areas. Like, again, I, I'm seeing, I look through the public uh, reports of Meta, Facebook, Google, and I looked at what is the one thing that they're all saying that they're investing in, which is their fancy way of saying we're going to put a bunch of money and we're going to hire people and we'll pay them well. And the only thing that they all mentioned was AI. That's the only one, but I don't think AI will be as big as, let's say, generic software engineering was, or, you know, there was a mix of, we needed everything. We needed back and we needed mobile. And also, realistically, so those skills of being lar building large-scale distributed systems or large mobile apps or large web apps, they're a lot more common they are today than they were you know, like five or 10 years ago. And now there's a lot of infra infrastructure. You, don't, you no longer need to build and manage your server fleet. You just you know, use AWS and they use their service that just auto-scales for you. So I feel there's, you know, there has definitely been a commoditization of skills that used to be very unique. And it's going to continue. And the only way I think we would see this like golden decade continue after this bounce back is if there was more areas that are just new that you need to learn and a few people know it, where you need to hire these people who keep doing it. And, you know, data engineering is a little bit of this right now. Machine learning, AI. I think, I think it's only around AI that I'm seeing a, a large pull right now. Yeah. Where will that next platform come from if it will will it be you know apple's next entry into the mixed reality space i think they're supposed to be launching their glasses next year perhaps will that be as big as a mobile phone hard to believe that it would be the metaverse i think even zuckerberg saying this thing is like five or ten years out if it ever comes to you know fruition and his vision of what that is Self-driving cars are, are going a lot slower as well. The one thing that I, I do see that I think is a little bit more realistic, and again, like it's hard to predict the future, right? Like, but uh, we can always try. 
one thing I'm kind of seeing is, is the sure thing that I think is happening is these niches, these industries, like tech is everywhere, but it hasn't conquered a lot of areas, you know, like online shopping done. Amazon has done it with a mix of technology and hardware and logistics, but there's a lot of industries which are kind of up for grabs, you know, like there's, uh, there's this company called Steady who are trying to revolutionize the EDI uh, system, which is this when you're ordering like parts from each other, there's like this electronic device ident- or, or something identifier where like these big manufacturers do it. It's like a super unsexy business. And the, the person who's doing it, the founder only knows it because he ran his own he ran his shop, I think, where, where he sold like very specific parts. And he was like, this is so outdated. So they're trying to revolutionize, like, like bring technology to that sector. And that looks like really promising, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like w- wedding planners or or funerals or, you know, like local restaurants or all of these businesses that are, are operating, helping them do things more efficiently with technology because that is still there. You know, if you're going to go into a restaurant and you're going to see how can we make this run more efficiently, either make more profit or have less cost, technology is still kind of an obvious answer. The question is just, can you actually put it in place? So I think we're going to see a lot of these, like, you know, the real world meets technology in a way that you have a domain expert, someone who's like, you know, let's say who's been a chef or if it's a restaurant or, or ran restaurants and they have this idea and eventually, you know, they do a startup, but it's no longer just a digital only thing. It's a real world and a digital thing, which means that software engineers will not be like fully in charge, you now need someone who knows this business. But I think there will be some really good opportunities that just they just might not be unicorns, but they will be places that are, are good businesses, they're honest businesses. Uh, so we might actually just take a step back from this, like, oh, you know, I'm 20 years old, I just graduated, I joined this company called Snap in 2008. And like five years later, I'm a millionaire, that probably will not happen as much. But there will be a lot of things where I love software engineering and I love using it in the real world. And I'm actually helping change this small industry, which actually is really interesting when you look into it. Mm-hmm. And I'm helping the lives or, or, or I'm helping people make more money or, or do things better, et cetera. And maybe one more thing is just an interesting one to just keep coming back to. This. I, I, I sometimes think of it and I talk about healthcare. So there is a lot of investment going in. And these big pharma has poured a lot of money for like five to 10 years to try to bring technology that that will help people result in in better care or better prescriptions or or whatnot. And there's an aging population. So that is also there. So I do think, you know, there's a lot of like, I I just gave a bunch of examples here. I think there's a lot of things to be excited about, but I think we just need to be a bit more grounded because the whole like, you know, from zero to billion dollar company is not going to happen. In fact, these billion dollar companies just are in hindsight, we're probably like highly, highly inflated and we should just set our, our expectations. Yeah, I was, uh, I was talking to Jerry before this call. There was a, something I didn't share in Change All News because I was skeptical of some of the details behind it, but it was this, the title says, which one of these will be the biggest unicorn failure ever? And it cites all these larger companies. Uber was one of them with little to no profits and they're 10 years old, 20 years old. And it's a small swath of them, but there's also tons of opportunity in the boring business sector. Uh, I mean, I've been turned onto this more half tempted just to buy a bunch of laundromats, you know, kind of thing. But like, think about the innovation <laughs> if you're a software developer, right? I was telling Jared this, like, this is a sort of a silly kind of crazy idea. There's a lot of boom happening in the RV space, but there's no Tesla in the RV space aside from say Airstream. And they've been around for a very long time. And it's mainly their quintessential, you know, external design with good taste on the inside. Most RVs are kind of ugly. But almost none of them have a LAN network. Almost none of them have high quality software. Almost none of them have, you know, a lot of thought put into like people who are younger and into more smart things or automation things. It's kind of like an untapped market. If you can, you know, do electrical engineering and mechanical engineering and software engineering and all these different things come to play in these boring sectors or even recession resistant places like laundromats, uh, elder care, healthcare, as you mentioned storage facilities, there's a lot of automation that can happen there. Like if you own an RV park that was automated fully by software, it takes land, which appreciates software, mostly automated, maybe one operator. Like if you're a software engineer, it might be time to follow, I think, what was her name? Jared Ann's advice from Wired. She was saying in the article you posted. Amanda Hoover. Uh, there's a couple of different directions you might go. And, and one might be just to take that big risk and start your own company. But my advice on top of hers would be, Consider boring sectors or recession-resistant sectors that just, like you had said, Gary, there's just no, 
there's no one there innovating in the software spaces because it's all been kind of laser focused into these self-driving cars, AI and things, which that area is growing, but it's being sort of laser focused in this online only space where maybe the, the riches that can be found are in this mixed medium, this in-person brick and mortar, you know, physical places where technology just hasn't been brought to the forefront there. I don't know what kind of advice that is there, but there's a lot of opportunity out there in spaces that you just may have not thought of. Yeah, and I, I feel also that like going forward for the next like couple of years, the kind of mainstream advice might apply less. You know, the mainstream advice until now, like if you wanted to have a really successful and profitable career in tech was learn how to code. If you have the opportunity to go to university just because now you have a pedigree, try to get into one of these big techs as soon as you can and then jump around from there. You know, like if you cannot get straight into like Facebook or Google, try to go at a tier lower, uh, you know, like Foursquare or Yelp or have really good cultures, but they're not as well known as some of the others and then try to like hop your way up. And once you're there and you made as a staff engineer at Facebook, you're probably making so much money that, I mean, if you're spending it all, you're you're crazy because you, you should have just like saved some of that for a time like now. But and then the advice kind of ends there. And I, I do talk with people who are five or 10 years into their career or let's say like more like eight to 10 years. They made as a staff engineer to one of these companies and they're like, what next? Because I'm now making so much money, I cannot go anywhere, which I mean, it's it's not a bad problem to have, but they just feel a little bit trapped because they went there so quickly. And compare this with people who kind of got there after 30 years, like in the past, I, I know people who retire from similar situations, like at the end of their career as a staff or a principal engineer as well. So this used to be the traditional advice and it kind of worked for so many people because big tech was hiring so many people. Like this was kind of achievable for most people. And this route will always be there. Like I've seen this in the investment banking. So when I joined JP Morgan in 2010, I worked on the front office and <laughs> banks are really good. They have front office, middle office, back office is based on how much money you make. Like the front office is making all the money, middle office is supporting the front office, back office is just cost center, like clearing stuff. And so I work with traders and what I noticed is I was on a desk, we had like 10 traders that we were supporting, we were building software for them. And when I joined, we had 10 traders, a year later we had six and they never got backfilled. And these were the traders who are making the literally the millions in compensation per year, at, at least a million. They were making these outside bonuses. And I asked the traders like, hey, like, how was it like? And they were like, oh yeah, back in the day, like this desk used to have 30 traders. And I asked, like, what is it like to, but we're just kind of, you know, getting fewer. It's, it's just because they were, when they let people go, they actually hired like two software engineers to do algorithmic trading or just like, you know, the same thing, but for cheaper or similar stuff. And then they told me that to become a trader, like it used to be that it used to be pretty easy back in the day, like, or not that easy, but you just need to go to a good school. But now you have to go to a good school. You need to have the connections. They will tell you what the interview is like. And some of the interviews are ridiculous. Back then they claimed that there's like some reflex tests and all that. They will tell you what it's like so you can prepare. So basically you had to have, to get that job, you need to have pedigree. You need to have connections, often family connections. And then you had a chance at an interview where you had to do really good. You needed to be really good. So I think this is slowly going to happen with, with let's say big tech where they will be hiring, but you will need pedigree, you know, they're not going to hire you off of a boot camp or nothing or a previous company. And then you'll also need to do well there. So it's just going to be a lower funnel. And the other advice, so this advice will still be there, but it'll be harder to do. But the other advice that no one will talk about is what you said is ignore the mainstream and look into interesting sectors. And this will be hit or miss, but there will be some people who will do great at these no-name companies that no one knows about. Some will be absolute flaws, but some will be just really fun where, where you get to grow. You get like pretty good compensation and you grow with the company and you're solving for a really interesting a challenge and you know maybe that also gives you ideas to potentially start your own company or partner with something or just stay at a company for a long time and i'm now into the industry long enough that i have these weird kind of reflections uh when i worked in like on kind of industries or areas that i might have like looked down a little bit on for example the government sector when i lived in edinburgh more than like 10 years ago it was like maybe like 12 or i don't even know like yeah it was like more like 13 14 years ago i built an app called edinburgh bus tracker on windows phone because i went every day to work and there was an app for iphone and one for android but none for windows phone and i was i just wanted to know when my bus would arrive so i built this but in building it i had to reach out to the local council and they had a tech team who were building this API. And I kind of talked with them and, and they made some changes to their API and I just built it, I forgot about it. And now just like, I think six months ago, a guy wrote to me saying like, hey, 
I think I tweeted about this app that I did. And he said like, oh, I'm still here and I'm still building the, the API and it's really cool. And I was like, hold on, like you've been there for 12 years working at the council on the API team. And I started just talking and it was like, yeah, it's actually really good. It's just a really friendly place. Uh, it kind of feels like family and we get to experiment a lot and we do these things. And in my mind, if you would have asked me, like, you know, I was always someone who just wanted to climb subconsciously the ladder. I want, always wanted to not to climb, but I want to prove myself that I'm, I'm good enough for the next thing. But now I'm reevaluating of like, hey, you know, like this person, you know, he's a software engineer. He works at a job which probably, you know, it pays the bills. It is really important for the community. He gets to have a lot of professional freedom. He actually, you know, like people are using it. So, you know what? There's not just one way to have a fulfilled professional life. And I think that's what a lot of the career advice focuses on, like, just go higher and higher and higher and more and more and more. Where, Whereas, you know, now is the time, like, and that person is definitely not afraid of any layoffs, right? Like, everyone else who's stressing, like, that's going to be the last place that is impacted for obvious reasons. So I think, you know, one thing that I'll take away from this is try to talk with other people outside of your bubble, other software engineers, or if you're an engineering manager, other engineering managers, and just approach those people with curiosity, because I think this is how my worldview is changing a little bit. I get more empathy. And you also just build up a better network, right? Like, you just get to know those people. And, and I think you'll be a bit more grounded. Like, I mm-hmm. I think, you know, like, it's tech is still really big. And there's so many people doing so many different things. And this is actually, by talking with these different people, this is how you might find out that, that absolutely boring industry that is actually really exciting. And now is a good time to jump into it. Uh, now that, you know, big tech is uh, just really, everyone is focusing their attention right there. This episode is brought to you by Influx Data, the makers of the Influx DB time series platform. With its data collectors and scripting languages, a common API across the entire platform, and highly performant time series engine and storage, Influx DB makes it easy to build once and deploy across multiple products and environments. The new Influx DB storage engine allows developers to build real time applications even faster and with less code, faster write and query performance with a new purpose built columnar time series database that combines a hot, compressed, in memory data store and a cold object store. Unlimited cardinality lets you slice and dice on any dimension without sacrificing performance. And more options than ever to query data, including native SQL support. If you want to learn more and see how the new InfluxDB engine works, sign up for the InfluxDB beta program at InfluxDB.com slash changelog. Again, InfluxDB.com slash changelog. I always say, if you're going to take on risk, take it on your own terms, you know, that's kind of one thing as well. If there's going to be a risk in the market, take it on your own terms and, uh, and don't be afraid in that front. But at the same time, I do have a lot of empathy for people with change. Change is super hard. Jerry, we got to mention, I'm not sure if it'll make it onto the air because I'm not sure where we talked about it at, but we mentioned who moved my cheese recently when we we're in, in the hallway track at all things open. And, you know, this is the time of, of change and resilience, you know, find if things are moving and changing and you got to change with it. But at the same time, like a lot of people just want to have impact. And maybe the best way you have an impact is with people you enjoy working with for 13 years, you know, with no concerns or no stress. And maybe you're not getting paid the most, but maybe, maybe that's not even concern for you because what you're optimizing for, which I think is a big key for a lot of people, they're not really sure what they're optimizing for. Like you had said, you were optimizing for, you know, personal satisfaction in the fact that you could grow and you could do and you could reach which is great. And there's nothing wrong with that. If that's what you're optimizing for, then you take the path you took. But if you're optimizing for enjoying the people you're around, the impact, maybe even community, maybe you don't jump around like most people do every two or three years to different companies, maybe even less than that. You know, that's also a market condition, but also a personal condition you choose to take on. So what are you optimizing for? And and then what you optimize for, there's this really interesting mental model that one of my former colleagues at Uber, uh, she's a really, really good engineering manager. Now she's actually a director, she's a VP of engineering at Molly. Her name is Anna Lore. And we were just having dinner uh, the other day. We got back together with some of the engineering managers at, at Uber. 
And I was just talking about this on how, you know, there's money, there's also career. And she says, she's like, I got a really simple like framework that has worked really well for me. And it's three things, challenge, environment, compensation, and figure out which one is the most important to you and which one is the least one. Like there's going to be one that you don't really, because what that means is if two of these are good enough, then you'll actually take that position or opportunity. Uh, So for example, let's say if you, if you're someone who, cares about like a lot of software engineers will care about interesting problems which is challenge and then you need to decide like what is the next most important thing is it the environment that you're at a friendly place and and all that or is it the compensation where you know if it's challenging compensation then you'll probably go for places that have like kind of go 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 cultures but they pay well and it's really interesting challenges if it's environment then you might be okay taking a pay cut or something that is a lot less competitive or, or maybe more local but they're working on this really interesting thing or, or potentially even depending on where you put compensation or how much you might consider nonprofit, etc. And it's really interesting. And, and this changes over time. So it can change based on obviously compensation is a big one because that's the only one that you can really quantify. I think that's why people focus on it. Like you talk with people, you can compare your composition, you know, you're above or under, but you cannot really compare your environment or your challenges because it is subjective at all times. Well, Gary, it must be kind of a bittersweet time for you because while you're covering all of this downer news and a lot of your friends are seeing layoffs and cuts and there's just lots of bad going on, uh, you personally, it seems like your business is booming, your efforts with the Pragmatic Engineer, there's lots going on there. A year ago now is when we last talked and you were kind of forging this, this newsletter, this business around it. I don't think you had a job board back then. Maybe give us a quick rundown as it seems like you're doing very well, which is awesome. Tell us what's been going on. Yeah, so it, it just comes to show that like doing your own business can, well, first of all, like starting my own business was a little unexpected or how I started was unexpected. And maybe I dodged a ball here because my, my plan was, when we talked a year ago, I already started my newsletter, but my plan was originally quit Uber, uh, live off my savings for six months and finish a book because as we know, books don't really make any money, but I, I wanted to get that book out. I, it's called The Software Engineer's Guidebook and it's still not ready, by the way. Uh, but I, I wrote some other books and then my plan was to raise venture funding and start a company and do a startup and do some cool stuff around platform engineering. I had a bunch of different ideas to do. And in the end, that didn't happen. When I got to the decision time of like, do I want to raise venture funding and start a company? Or do I want to keep doing this, what I'm doing, which is writing, and it actually started to make some money online. And it seemed that just writing books would be able to cover my basic cost of living. I decided, all right, let me try to give this a go. And, and let me just try to do a paid newsletter. And this turned into a very viable business very quickly, which is it it turns out there is a demand for people to pay for more in-depth insights into how software engineering works at at big tech startups. And then later this expanded. So over the past year, I iterated on the format of the newsletter. I now have two articles. One is a more timeless article of how different things work in software engineering from engineering efficiency to, let's say, how you deploy to production or how certain companies do this or that. And then there's a more of a reflection that is called the scoop of what's going on in the tech world where I try to stay away from covering most of mainstream, although I, I do slide into that uh, every now and then. But I, I'm trying to like just give a sense of like what are people, software engineers, talking about or caring about. Unfortunately, a lot of it has been layoffs, but I'm also trying to look at for more uh, positive things that are happening. And as you said, like this business is, is doing great. More and more people are signing up both in terms of there's a free mailing list, there's a paid one. The paid one actually like I was giving out badges and I just crossed 10,000 paid subscribers, which is an incredible milestone. And now they're advertising it everywhere with the verified badge. I was not. Very cool. Good for you. You pay eight bucks a month for that or how does that work? <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> for your verified. Is the opposite, but it, it's, it's absolutely <laughs> booming. And there's a job board that I also started, which despite all of this uh, gloom and doom, more and more companies are signing up who I vet, so I, I don't approve all of them. I, I need to keep it high signal to noise. Uh, so that's also going up in the middle of a market that shouldn't be. So my business personally is going well. It's probably a mix of timing or, or demand, or maybe this is a timeless demand. It, it feels like it was probably a niche that was waiting to be filled potentially by someone. But it's one of those things where So I don't like to talk specifically about my business as much because this is just one specific business. And like people often, I find software engineers love to pattern match. And a lot of people are asking me, how can I do exactly what you're doing? And I don't have an answer to that. But what I can do is give some generic things of what helped me build this business and actually run it pretty well. 
And there are two things that actually helped me with this. One is I always did side projects on the side. I, I posted on, on Twitter, there's a, I have a spreadsheet of all the side projects I started uh, since I left college, like on the side of work. And there's a lot of them. And there were, at some point, I had this flashlight app that had 14 million downloads on Windows Phone. It was the most popular flashlight. And I, I, I built apps and I, I built websites and I, I launched, this is my third blog, actually, my current a software engineering blog that kind of grew into it. So I just did a lot of things on the side and I, I just got a bit of a sense, like I had this entrepreneurial spirit. So I got a sense of building and I got a sense of figuring out what works and what doesn't at a small scale. And I made some money online, like with the flash side app, I, I sold some ads. So I had a sense of like making my own kind of income, but all of this was, I guess, not deliberate looking back, it was practice. So now that I'm running my own business, I take a lot of the lessons that I did back then that I kind of learned the hard way. Because I think it's relatively easy to start a business, but just like, uh, you know, when someone is a second or third time founder, VCs will more likely to give them money because they learned on someone else's expense. You know, there's this like joke of why does Adam Newman get another investment round, which I think A16Z gave him another like how, how many, and there's a lot of outrage on that. And I, I think- 100 million or something like that, that was a lot of money. Yeah, but you know, there's a point there like, well, first of all, like, yeah, it's not really cool that they don't fund a lot of, I think, really capable entrepreneurs. But there's a point that he spent, I don't know, like a few billion of the other investors' money learning how to actually run an empire or a big uh, company, making a bunch of mistakes that he's like, assuming he's intelligent enough, he's not going to do those same mistakes, uh, which you cannot say for everyone. So a anyway, I'm giving a bit of benefit of the doubt. Like I still don't, I still think it looks very poorly on a 16 d for putting a lot of their money in, into these ones. But there is a, a point there. So going back to my point, like by doing side projects on the side, even if they're just absolute side projects, you kind of build that entrepreneurial muscle, which you need to do to build, run your own business. Uh, the other advice is just like, my advice is forget about this whole creator economy thing. There's everyone's talking about the creator economy and everyone's like fantasizing about like having an audience of so many people who they will, I don't know, like, uh, you know, like everyone wants to build an audience, even when they're at a like I, I meet people who are like, all right, my plan is I build an audience like on LinkedIn or Twitter, et cetera, and then I can leave my job. And well, I mean, audience is a distribution channel and distribution channels are important, but making that your main goal, it's kind of like a, a bit of a moot point. I happen to, I guess, you know, build an audience because what I was doing was writing and I started sharing my writing. Like my main thing was I, I was writing and it kind of helped that I was sharing this out, but my the way I look at what I'm doing is I'm running a business and like for a business, things like distribution matter, things like who are your customers are matter. What I find misleading is like just copying what you think is successful because I know some of these people who are making YouTube videos and they have millions of views and they don't have a business. Like they have sponsors, they're, they're stressed all the time because it goes up and down, but it's not a stable business. My business is actually pretty stable and pretty honest because people pay for value. I actually don't have any sponsors. Uh, well, then you know, your business is a good example as well, where, where you also have a business that is, is very viable. You know, your business will, the change log will have a mix of sponsors, a mix of people uh, paying for the premium, etc. So like treat it as a business. That, that's my second. I first one is do side projects. Second is like when you do a thing, don't think of creator economy, but think about like as a business. And I have an, an article on that. And the last one is, <laughs> this is a little bit like, if you want to do something a little bit similar to what I'm doing, which is I think of I, I'm educating people in many ways, work in the industry and do interesting things in places where it's hard to get into. Because the reality is that the reason a lot of people pay attention to what I say, because I've done it. I've done a lot of the things that are, are not as trivial. Like I, I happened to be there when we rewrote the whole Uber app in three months, and I was one of the very many people. But I, I kind of was part of that experience, and it's it was a rare thing to do. But I, I really went and worked in the industry, and I, I, never, I didn't go there and work there because I wanted to do this. It was the opposite. I worked there, and I made a lot of, I just learned a lot, and I became good at certain areas. And it's a lot easier to teach once you've done it. And so a lot of the thing I do is teaching. So that's kind of like just generic advice. Like it's counterintuitive, but you know, be good at your job, be really good. Because if you're not good at your job, you'll have a hard time launching a business that has to do with something with sharing. You might be able to launch something else, by the way, and then just do side projects because you'll figure out what you do. The pragmatic engineer came about because I was blogging on the side for a long time. I, I just loved it. Uh, I just liked doing it. I, I learned that I, I loved writing, not because I ever thought that it would turn into business. And uh, okay, last advice is is, <laughs> number four. Is, is save up. So you know, like just to summarize the advice is it was uh, do side projects like 
understand that a business, like what businesses are, even your current business, work in the industry and get that expertise and save up enough savings that you can actually take a risk. I would have never done the pragmatic engineer if I didn't have like a year or two of savings and I was able to quit my job and I said, I'm not going to look for anything for six months. I'm just going to do me. I'm just going to write this book. And I said no to all of the recruiter reach outs because obviously when you're experienced, people come your way, they want to recruit me for this or that or have a coffee or get me an advisor. I said no to everyone because I was on no one's payroll anymore. And I just chilled and I kind of the inspiration came. I, I If I didn't do this, the pragmatic engineer would not exist as, as it does today. Well, they say a step away to get unstuck or sometimes step away to find the direction that you need to go. Not so much get unstuck, but find the path that you want to take. I think you do a great job with writing. I think one thing that you do really well is you you shine a light in an area where it's very hard to quantify the details and share the details of a very just hard to understand world. And not a lot of people have the trust and the access that you have. And then the, also the background that you have. So I think that you do a great job of like demystifying and clarifying a lot of things that are just challenging to have visibility into. And then you've gained the trust of many people because you write honestly, you, you were in the right place at the right time, but you were also there with passion and preparation, you know? So you can't discount that ability, which is it takes time to get that passion. Well, I guess passion can kind of come at any point, but the preparation is, you know, it's timely. It takes time to get that. Yeah. And, and I guess the last one, it just reflects on me. I think it's just be curious. And this goes back to what we we're talking about, the boring industries. Like one of my best reasons that I feel I was successful in my career and now in my new career as well, I'm just really interested in stuff and in people. So, and maybe this comes from intrinsically and maybe you cannot do it. I don't know, but I'll tell you, you know, at, at Uber, for example, like one of the things that, I thought helped my success is like when I would sit down to have lunch, I would try to just go to someone and say like, Hey, can I, do you mind if I have lunch with you? Like, let me just introduce myself. And where do you work? What do you do? Like, Oh, customer support. Tell me about that. That's like, I I have no clue. Like in my mind, customer support is this boring thing, but I'm sure it's really exciting. So like, can you tell me? And I just then shut up and, and listen. And I actually met a lot of people and later just at my job, something came up and someone was like, oh, something customer support. There's a customer support agent sending us a ticket. And I was like, oh, hold on. I know a person from there. Let me just ping them. And they're like, oh, yeah, I know what was going on. And people were like, oh, wow, you are so connected. And I wasn't trying to be connected. I was just really curious. I was really interested in, in what is your world look like? And when I was in London, actually, uh, for some time, I reached out to a few fellow tech leads or, or senior software engineers. And I said, like, hey, I'm working at Skyscanner as an iOS engineer. You're an Android or iOS engineer at this other company. Do you want to just have coffees on me? Like, do you want to just meet? Because I would love to learn, like, what you are doing. Like, you're in this different company. And I want to get a sense of what are your challenges. And maybe we can learn from each other. And if not, just, you know, coffee was on me. So I did this for a few times. And I, I stopped doing it after a while because I met enough people. But this curiosity of, again, just especially if you're feeling smug about how good you are at your company or how great of a place you are, just talk to someone else because it'll, first of all, get you grounded and you'll learn more. And I think a lot of potentially maybe one of the things that people might like about writing, I'm super curious. And this is one of the reasons I love doing it. I I get to talk with so many people. Now that the news that I was a little bit better known, most people will respond if I reach out to them. But I have a long list of things I'd love to learn more about because I think the whole industry is fascinating. I think we don't know what we don't know, and we don't know a lot of things. One of the things on my bucket list, I'll just put it on here, and if someone works there, they can contact me. One of my things on my bucket list is, which is just hard to do, is at some point try to get either on the record or off the record people who who build spaceships at the likes of SpaceX or NASA or the European Space Agency to talk about like how they do that stuff. And the reason is hard. I don't know how confidential all this is. And I'm not interested in confidential details, but of like, you know, like how is that world different? How can you get in there? What are the differences to, for example, when you're building a social media app or just, a, you know, like something that is a little bit more traditional software engineering. So. Yeah, I think the world is is super interesting, super exciting. And it's there actually, like what I've noticed, software engineers never get asked, or even most people in the business you work at, like a customer, someone who works in customer support operations, they never get asked by a person who's not a manager. They don't walk up to them and say like, hey, I'm interested in what you're doing. Can you tell me? And I'm also a software engineer, so happy to, you know, trade notes. Yeah, for sure. Get humble, be curious. But uh you got to pragmaticengineer.com is where people can go to find all the stuff you do, right? Exactly. 
I appreciate you coming back for this annual trip down. What's going to happen next? Maybe should we say you're coming back next year? Should we predict that? Is it a possibility? I'm, I'm going to come back next year. Now I, I love being on the chain. Like I love catching up with all, all of you. It's also, it's, it seems every year is different. So, you know, let's try to predict what might happen next year. Although predictions are, are uh, a little bit off. Let's see if this ages well. You predicting something now? Well, let, let's see how it ages. I do hope that in a year when I'll come back on the usual fall catch up, I hope, you know, this is not a prediction, but more of a hope. I hope we'll be through the, the most rocky part of this market. And I hope we'll just be like, there's just not much to talk about the market. It's not great. It's not bad. It is. I'd be very happy with that. And, you know, this is something that is hard to predict. I would hope that there's we're seeing a few more interesting areas that there were like, these are areas that we think are going to be, they're more likely that they'll be big. And this might be that we'll say that AI, ML or data engineering is bigger or, or there's something or maybe we're seeing that front end and mobile is, is moving closer together, mm-hmm. something like that. So it will be cool to see a little bit of movement because I, I feel there's a lot of like small wounds here and there, but I'm not seeing like a, a trend uh, change yet. Mm-hmm. Maybe next year we'll have Gerge AI or something like that, where we could just train a model on on your writing style, and you could just <laughs> stop doing what you do. It's like uh, since you mentioned Silicon Valley, it's like Dinesh and Guilfoyle. When Dinesh was chatting with Guilfoyle all day, but it was actually Guilfoyle's AI, and oh yeah, he was like, oh my gosh, that was that was the coolest part. But maybe we'll have a Gerge AI or something like that next year. That would be cool. Yeah, that will be cool. So, well, this was awesome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming, man. Thanks again for coming on the show. We always love having you. Appreciate it. Okay, that's it. Thank you for tuning in. Hey, if you've got some thoughts, some tips, some ideas, some anythings, shout out in the comments. The link is in the show notes. We want to hear from you. Have you heard? Hey, there's new t-shirts, new stock in the merch store, merch.changelaw.com. Check it out. And for those who've been asking, Kaizen shirts are in stock. Check them out. They're awesome. Once again, a big, big thank you to our friends at Fastly and Fly. And of course, to Breakmaster Cylinder. Those beats are banging. We love them. And we think you love them too. But hey, that's it. This show's done. Thank you for tuning in. We will see you on Monday.